common trope I hear is that the French wars of religion and their brutality paved the way for France's secularism, for the Enlightenment, for the philosophe, for this rejection of religious bigotry. I don't think that's the case at all. It, although it, it's, it's become almost a truism that, you know, this is supposed to be the great effect of the French wars of religion is that France, you know, they, they began to, you know, wonder, you know, you know, what kind of religion is this that makes people kill each other over, you know, over differences of opinion. Although I suppose this response would make some sense, it's not the response that occurred. What happened is somewhat more, I guess, chilling in the way, I mean, what it tells us about how humans behave. What happened was a religious revival in France, without question. The late, 15, uh, late 1500s, 1580s, to the early 1600s, there's this massive revival, not, not just of religion, but of basically of Catholicism in France. Because the Huguenots have been pretty much wiped out by the wars. Now, the Huguenots continued fighting after, you know, their major, some of their major field defeats, like Mont Contour, and their major, you know, in the disaster of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre that killed so much of their leadership, but politically they were more or less neutered by this and by Henry IV, their leader, converting to Catholicism. The real intellectual, as it were, result of the French wars of religion, there are, there are two. There's the religious and there's the political response. The religious response is this Catholic revival, this, you know, surge of involvement in confraternities and... Um, you know, in the number of priests and nuns and people joining holy orders. The political response is a disillusionment with the power of, as it were, petty nobles in comparison to that of the state. You have a reaction against uh, the small centers of power in favor of absolutism. Eventually this will manifest in the absolutism of Richelieu, and later Louis XIV. These are the major results of the French Wars of Religion, not the birth of tolerance or skepticism about religion. It's really just a sort of triumphalism surrounding Catholicism. Now, the Catholic faction, as it were, didn't exactly win the war. The Catholic League was defeated, its leaders uh, beaten, or for the most part, bought off by Henry of Navarre, and royal authority restored, but that authority was a Catholic authority, in line with the religious attitudes of most of France. Uh, they were, you know, they were, the average Frenchman was against the ultramontanist ideas, some of the ultramontanist ideas of the League. The League really, the Catholic League really got its steam from the prospect of a Protestant king, and when that's gone, the league, the league loses a lot of its impetus. It has to rely more and more on Spain, on Spanish money and soldiers. And Henry manages to pacify the country, and the more he pacifies the country, the more people he can buy off. But this is really a victory for the French crown, not so much for the Huguenots, although a few still follow Henry. Of course, none of them follow the league, um, but a few still follow Henry, but many of them drop off. They go home. Um, so this is, this, the Huguenots almost don't feature in this, you know, final act of the French Wars of Religion. The Edict of Nantes, of course, was, you know, it was, it gave the Protestants as much freedom as they, you know, perhaps even more freedom than the Edict of January in 1560, um, 1560, uh, gosh, 1562, I think. Um, it's been a while before I've read about the Edict of January. But I think this idea of the French force of religion as this kind of vindication of secularism, that's certainly not how people saw it at the time. Maybe it's how a few people saw it at the time. I don't doubt that, but I, I, that's just not how the majority of people reacted. We can't see history in the context of you know everything leading up to a certain point, and that certain point in French history is the revolution, which overturns the Ancien Regime, and you know, everything changes in French history after 1789. But to view that as kind of everything culminating at it, no, there, there are multiple steps by which this sort of thing happens. And, and any event you know, between the Hundred Years' War and, and the Revolution isn't necessarily some sort of lead up to the Revolution. It, it isn't 
part of a process of making the revolution more inevitable or, or, or anything like that. Not necessarily. Another thing I, I wanted to maybe ramble on about a bit is the prospect of Huguenot victory, as it were, in France. Now, the Huguenots were a tiny percentage of the population, maybe at the most 10%, although even that figure has been, you know, I, I've, I've read some, you know, more, some somewhat recent scholarship that says probably more like five at the peak. But it's powerful among the nobility, and for a brief period of time, maybe eight months or so, uh, coinciding largely with the presence of Jeanne d'Albray, the uh, Protestant Queen of Navarre at court. Um, in 1561 to early 1562, there is this possibility that the, that the royal family is turning toward Protestantism. Now, this is blown out of the water for a couple reasons. First of all, there was a somewhat disastrous speech by Theodore Beza, who is the deputy of John Calvin, this Genevan minister, who comes to the French court to participate in the colloquy of Poissy. He makes some remarks that are extremely offensive to Catholic sensibilities, uh, and this hurts their cause somewhat. Um, another thing is that a lot of the, you know, a lot of the nobles see what's going on and they band together to put an end to Protestant uh, preaching in court. And it had gotten to a point where there are stories that circulated. I mean, well, this one, well, one of them isn't so much a story. It's one of them is, is I think, pretty much accepted that the the young king and his uh, and his brothers, while Catherine Benici was meeting with a, the papal legate, I believe, her, two of her sons, the king and the dauphin, uh, marched along uh, dressed as, um, you know, Roman prelates, uh, doing a sort of a, a mock procession, and these legates were appalled by what they saw in Catherine's. Oh, they're just kids. Don't worry. Um, other incidents include uh, the young, the the sister of uh, of the king, Margaret claiming that, you know, the, the Dauphin, uh, Alexander, was, you know, taking her Catholic books of hours and throwing them into the fire and then trying and chasing her around, singing psalms from a Huguenot psalm book. And I realize these are little kids. I think they're, they're, they're maybe 10 at most at this point, I think. Um, but it's still, this sort of thing, when people see it in the court, it just appalls them. And so the Duke of Guise, for instance, is shocked by what he sees uh the um the constable and the shocked by what he sees there's also a, another incident reported by jeanne d'albray this protestant queen of navarre this very okay calvinist maybe would be the better word for this because there's also there aren't very many lutherans in france but they're a rather powerful political force in the international scene because many of the german princes who are, you know, whose domains are more or less at peace, who are able to levy troops, who are able to exert diplomatic influence. They are Lutheran, and they, you know, and they're, they, they view the, Cal the, the Calvinists very negatively themselves. There is an incident told of where the Calvinist Queen of Navarre, Jeanne d'Albray, is approached by the young king, Charles, who says to her, I only go to Mass because my mom makes me. And when I grow up, I want to be a Huguenot just like you. I want to be a Calvinist. Don't tell my mother. Um, now, of course, this is uh, reported by Jeanne d'Albray. Not entirely... Um, so isn't entirely reliable. But I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility. Because of what Catherine Vedici does in February 1562. She realizes how you know, how open the atmosphere has gotten at court. So she dismisses all of the young king's liberal tutors, replaces them with hardcore Catholic ones, forbids her ladies at waiting to discuss Calvinist ideas. So I think that, that this this era of late 1561, early 1562, because if you think about it, if the court had gone Calvinist, if Catherine Bedici had come out there and said, I have decided to accept the gospel, 
um, according to etc cetera, etc cetera. nothing gospel according to etc cetera, et cetera. but the you know decided to accept the accept the ideas of Calvin to break away from the Roman Church that would have caused an avalanche of people you know who are either you know, skeptical or reticent you know or, or just afraid of coming out as Calvinist um, that would have led to a cascade of them openly proclaiming their beliefs, which would have led to a cascade of their, um, of many of their clients coming out with these beliefs. It would have, uh, I think it would have probably caused an immediate civil war, but I think that would have made this, this huge impact. And I think once these wars begin, there's not the, this chance for Calvinism to become the dominant religion in France goes away and it becomes a question of can the Calvinists maintain political power despite being a minority religion? And later on, once it becomes, you know, once the conflict intensifies, once it becomes clear that they, to the Calvinists that they just cannot trust the crown, that they have you know, no reason paying it anything other than lip service, the question becomes how can we make this state within a state? How can we get the south of France into an order where we can we can, you know, basically rule ourselves. Um, that's all for today, I think. Uh, this is obviously the first video I'm putting up. I This is definitely not my last word on the French Wars of Religion. There's, It's one of these topics that just has not penetrated kind of popular culture so you know you don't the average person doesn't get any of this stuff by osmosis there's like the mistakes i've made in this in this video itself even though i've done a ton of reading on the subject and frankly the subject is kind of it's kind of what i do um i i mean i, I don't go into religious wars what i mean is i'm studying the french wars of religion i you know, it, it's one of these things where I, I'm i not, this isn't my last word on the subject, obviously, or even on the particular questions I've raised. In any case, have a nice day and thank you for listening.